Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're watching us from. Welcome to today's episode of Sedat HR Digest. Um, before I introduce our topic and our guest to you for today's episode, we would like to remind you that Sedat HR Digest is brought to us by Sedat Consult. And you can contact Sedat Consult on 0244-6292. Four five zero two four four six two nine two four five. All right, wherever you're watching us from, we want you to feel free to drop your name and location in the comments um, session, and we would read it out for a resource person to respond to you. All right, so share with us your name, your location. Um, we want to acknowledge you. Okay, and um, we have, um, trust me, today we'll have an interesting session. So let me go. Um, Darko says, good afternoon. Um, this is Godana. Hey, I hope I pronounce your name well uh, from Kumase. Thank you, Darko, for watching us from Kumase. Wherever you are, please drop your name, your location. We want to duly acknowledge you. Also share the link with your loved ones, your colleagues, and your friends. Let's gather here, learn together, and impact our organizations together. Today we are dealing with um, disengagement, quiet quitting, and great resignation. And we have a resource person who is an expert, um, a voice, an influencer in the HR fraternity. She is not new to us on Sadat HR Digest. Anytime she joins us here, we learn a lot. And I know today will be no exception. Great nuggets would be shared with us. Right. So I have Mamiesi from um Mamiesi watching us from Accra. Um and then we have Eliane from Accra also. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Please share, comment, like on all our social media platforms. We are on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. That's a Sadat HR Digest brought to us by Sadat Consult. I have Ebenezer. Ebenezer says, good afternoon. I am watching from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you, Eben. Great to have you here. All right. So our resource person for today, like I said, is no new face to us on Sedat HR Digest. Dr. Mrs. Irene Stella Ejeni Mbwate is a consultant, um, HR and leadership development expert, a former advisor to the chief executive of Volta River Authority and a former Deputy Chief Executive Services um, at VRA. Um, she holds a doctorate degree in business administration and a Master of Applied Business Research degree from the Swiss Business School. Currently, she serves as the Vice Chairperson of the Public Services Commission here in Ghana. And um, we are happy to have Dr. Mrs. Stella Ejenimboa to join us on today's episode of HR Digest. Hi, Doc. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, patients, and good afternoon, everyone listening to us or watching us. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here once again, and I want to commend Sedat Consult for the good work that you are doing, especially within the HR fraternity and I believe for organizations. Because when HR takes, organizations take. And I'm glad that we cannot be of, you know, um, some help and support uh, towards the work that you are doing. Thank you for having me. Right, Doc. Thank you so much. And we are super excited to have you here. And um, like I told you, it has started already. When HR takes, the organization takes. Thank you, um, Doc. Today we are looking at um, dealing, how to deal with um, this engagement. We have a lot of practitioners and organizational leaders who are unable to tell whether their staff or their team members are engaged or disengaged. Um, over um, some few months or recently, we've been hearing of, I think since COVID, we've been hearing of great resignation, quiet um, quitting and all that. I want to dive deep 
into that conversation um, for today that your rich experience in the business environment will help us um, understand our topic for today's episode or why so before we we move to um our conversation i have stephanie dan so um stephanie says she's watching us from i am free thank you so much stephanie um we met last two weeks and um, it was great meeting you again after the um, conference in Kumasi. All right, Doc. Um, so we want you to help us understand what great resignation and quiet um, quitting is all about. We've been hearing it. It's been trending. Um, help us understand, help us gain some insight in what these two trending topics are. All right. Thank you so much. Um, once again, let me say that this is a very interesting, you know, area that we all want to um, kind of explore. Very interesting because a lot of things are happening in our organizations, as you said, that sometimes as leaders or as HR people, we do not avert our minds to. And before, you know, we can, we can, we wake up one morning, we realize that a lot of, you know, things have happened and we have no answers to them. So it's important to understand these. And of course, as you said, if you talk about, you know, great resignation, it's, it's, it's about, you know, a, a mass in called a kind of exodus where, you know, uh, within a short period of time, you, you realize that a lot of your people especially your key talent uh, are resigning voluntarily not because you know anything massive is happening in the organization that warrants the resignation but people are just leaving and you know you start asking yourself why and of course i'm sure we'll come to the why but basically if we want to understand in simple terms um, a great resignation is where many employees voluntarily resign and Either they are they are going seeking for new opportunities, or they have found new opportunities, or some are actually leaving the, the the world of work, you know, the world of former corporate world as it were. And so that is what we term great resignation because it's the, the great is in reference to the mass within a, a period of time you know, within some kind of time frame. So look at it from that, that angle. And when we talk about quiet quitting, you know, quiet quitting, interestingly, is about people who are within the organization working with you, but they just work to rule. I mean, they, they ensure that yeah, they fulfill all righteousness for as long as it's within the set rules. So you are not going to get any issues with them because um, they didn't do what they had to do. But of course, you're also not going to get the best out of them because they're only fulfilling the minimum work requirement. What the work requires, they will do. And their, their engagement with the organization and with every aspect of the work they do is very discretionary. So they are there with you. They haven't quit, but they are quietly quitting by not getting themselves involved in anything outside of the work that has been assigned to them. So they will meet the essentials, the things that they have to do, what will not get them into trouble, they will do it. But nothing you know, outside of that, displaying anything of uh, uh, the initiative or any interventions will not be their thing. And so basically, these are the kind of people that you can categorize in your organization to find out those who are leaving and leaving sometimes on block voluntarily or, you know, leaving and then you try to trace and you realize that they are going into other industries or they are not even joining the, the corporate or former workforce anymore. Whilst quite quitting are people who are still within your employee, who are still within the organization, but they are working to rule. So you will not have a reason to, to sanction them for not doing what they have to do, but they will not go beyond what has been assigned them. They will just do the minimum that is required without stretching themselves or trying to be uh, innovative around anything. And they don't get you know, into any other activity that the organization is engaged in because they, in their minds, they are quitting 
and that we call it, you know, quitting. So it's it's a kind of process. They are quitting, but they are doing it quietly. So it becomes a mental state. Uh, they know what they are doing, but they are gradually disengaging, uh, disconnecting themselves without giving you the opportunity to 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 sanction them for anything that they are not doing because every essential will be done. But anything else outside of those essentials, you can you you know you definitely have to count them out because they will not be you know involved. So for these two uh, terminologies, these are the, the the differences, and this is what you know uh, you try to find out to know where each person belongs in the organization. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Doc. So at this point, can we say that um, those are um, can we say that quiet creatures are disengaged? Um, if they are not, then at what point can an HR person or a team leader or an organizational leader tell that this team member of mine is, is being disengaged? At what point can we tell that? And maybe probably you would also want to throw um, a little light on what... Um, engagement and disengagement is so we can move to at what point that um, we can tell if they are disengaged all right okay so let me let me just try to um explain uh, disengagement and then we will see how these three kind of um uh, link uh, together to create a certain kind of, you know, uh, environment for us as HR people or as an organization. So when you talk about disengagement, look, people in your organization who are disengaged are employees who may be physically present. They are similar to their quiet, you know, uh, quitters. Physically present, but actually emotionally and mentally, they are just, they have just switched off. They are totally absent, but physically they are there. So their mindset their emotion, anything that creates a connection between them and the organization, it's not there. So they are disconnected and they will never recommend the organization or promote it, you know, whether among friends or family or anybody, because they are, they are quality, their soul, their heart, they are everything aside their, their physical being are not with the organization anymore. And so those people who are engaged, they do nothing motivates them. Nothing motivates them. And, you know, nothing excites them as well at the job. So if if they have to do something, I mean, they really have to struggle, as it were, you know, really strain themselves to even do what minimum uh, uh, um, requirements are. So the difference between them and the, the, the quiet quitters is that the quiet quitter is just planning a certain mental state of when am I going to physically get out of here? But until I get out of here physically, let me do what my work demands. Let me do what I have to do. But the disengaged person is so low on productivity, even for what they have to do. And increased absenteeism is associated with those who are disengaged. So again, I'm trying to bring out the differences between the two. The disengaged person will not even do the minimum unless you know you push and push and push. Because they are mentally switched off, they are emotionally switched off, physically they are present. So low productivity is associated with the disengaged person. Then increased absenteeism. Because the person is disengaged, disconnected, emotionally not there, switched off, uh, you know, uh, uh, mentally. Even coming to work is a, is, a, is, a, is a drain and it's a strain. So they wish that they could always find a reason to be absent. And so there's increased absenteeism when it comes to somebody who is dis disengaged and then they lack interest in everything about the organization. So the motivation is, you know, almost at a zero, zero point. So when they are there, you don't see them really trying to do anything except you push and demand. Then they will, you know, struggle to do what they have to do. Those people are disengaged. When you talk about the quiet quitters, as I explained earlier, Yes, they have a certain mindset that this is not where I really want to be. I really want to get out of here. However, for as long as I remain in and I have not quit, I will do what I have to do. 
just what I have to do. And those are the people we call work to rule kind of people. If you are saying that work starts at eight and closes at five, they're not going to give you excuses by coming at 8.30. <laughs> they will still be there at eight o'clock. But if it's a minute to five, their bags are ready. Five, they step out. They are not ready for anything else to do after that. And so if you, that is your policy, I mean, you cannot have a reason to sanction them because they have worked the minimum, the essential. You give them work, they do it, and they just do what is expected of them. They will not go the extra mile to, let's say, research into it for further interventions, for more innovation or anything. So they sit just within the boundaries of what the policy says and what the standards are, minimum. The disengaged does not even want to do what the minimum is. They are there, they are switched off, and when you know you have to push, they will struggle to do what they have to do. So those are the differences. However, you realize that those people who are disengaged and those quiet quitters, that is what actually leads to great resignation a lot of the times. So the disengaged, the quiet quitters put together can lead to great resignation. Because at that point, the disengaged person wishes that he could step out. At that point, the quiet quitter is planning a quit in his or her mind. And so when the opportunity comes, whether it's an opportunity to go into another organization or the opportunity is to say, I've decided that I don't even want this whole environment of you know work life and all that, so I want to do something differently. They quickly will put in their voluntary resignation. And that is when you will see a mass exodus. And that whole concept then becomes the great resignation. So I don't know whether that, that is, is clear for people to understand disengaged, totally switched off mentally and emotionally, nothing motivates them, not ready to do anything until you push beyond you know, the boundaries. They are totally disconnected and they will never recommend the organization to anyone. The quiet quitter has a certain mental state that says, in my mind, I'm in the process of quitting. However, until I quit, I still must do what is what is expected of me. But what is expected of me will always be just the minimum essentials. I'm not going to do anything before or after. I'm not going to do anything extra. I'm not going to go, you know, looking for any innovations to introduce. I will not introduce any interventions. All I will do is what has been assigned to me, straight jacket, this is my job description. I just do that. And when those two really get to the point when they want to leave the organization and they leave voluntarily because you wouldn't have pushed them out, then they, they, they come together or they culminate in that kind of exodus that will be described as great resignation. So um, I hope those distinctions are very clear. No. Yes, Doc, they, they are clear. And um, from the chat, okay, I have a response from um, Zachary. Zachary says, it's very clear, ma'am. Um, please let us know um, if you have or you would want any clarification to any of the things we are discussing over here. We are looking at dealing with this engagement, great resignation, and quiet quitting. If you want to ask any question um, at SEDAT HR Digest, it's a two-way, it's an interactive conversation that we have here. Please put your question in the comment box. I'll read it out for Doug to respond to you. Right, so we have feedback coming from our viewers. Um, Ofori says, very clear indeed. Um, Joyce says, great insight. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, um, Joyce. Um, Lian says, well explained things. All right, thank you all for the feedback. Now, Doc, let's let's come back to um, the subject of great resignation. Okay, so before I, I go there, somebody has, has asked a question, and um, this is coming from Kwame Boafo. He says, what is the role of psychological issue such as, right, such as, um, ADHA and depression in employee disengagement. All right, so Kwame, so ADHA, so um, I think it's a, it's a deficiency, you know, attention deficiency um, syndrome. 
sort of you know which can actually lead into depression and and all that you know stress and everything yes so <clears throat> in looking at that Kwame then we will have to get into the causes right causes of uh, disengagement because as you rightly said sometimes it can be a mental state that an individual has it can be psychological challenges that people are going through and that is why the issue of mental health has become very critical in our in our organizations today and hrs are expected to champion that people are going through all kinds of mental you know situations unfortunately in our part of the world uh, people don't even feel good wanting to talk about some of these challenges that they are going through because of the the way we brand and stereotype people who are going through depression who are going through so many stresses and so it's important that as hr people when you have even been able to categorize you know your people into whether they are disengaged and uh, you think that they are quiet quitters or you know uh, what is causing all this great resignation etc you need to start asking yourself what are the causes of this disengaged, you know, disengagement and everything. And if these are the causes, what is the mental state of the people? Because a lot of people, especially post-COVID, uh, it has become very prevalent that people have gone through and may still be going through a lot of challenges when it comes to, you know, work-life balance, when it comes to issues around, uh, um, you know, even getting the right jobs to do, when it comes to family stress, and so many other things. I mean, the economic, the global economic situation is giving some some kind of depression to people who who are working and are still struggling to make ends meet. Um, we have family challenges. Uh, people working at different, you know, like, let's say couple working from different locations, and therefore one becomes almost like a single parent, and you have to balance out how you are looking after the family and still trying to get the job done because you still need the job because you need to support your family with the finances. And there are people whose mental state cannot take all these things at the same time. And so they get into depression. And some also have, uh, you know, this attention deficiency, the ADHA, they have that attention deficiency because doing the same thing uh, over and over again gives them a lot of challenge. And so, I mean, in trying to address that, you are right, that you need to take on board what the causes are. And unfortunately, uh, when we are dealing with some of these things, there are people who will not um, try to analyze the external factors, external factors that are causing some of these problems. And which external factors, you know, I've talked about, I've seen family challenges, um, work-life balance, you know, a support or lack of support for that matter, a families that are broken, not living together. And, and you know, these are all, you know, economic conditions, um, social network that people don't have to be able to build the kind of support, social support, to learn the experiences of other people, to know that some have gone through maybe even better experiences. Uh, COVID, people losing their loved ones and sometimes sitting back to say that COVID is over. So couldn't my, my loved one have been spared, you know, during that period because um, if something else had been done, perhaps I wouldn't have lost this. And people go through all that kind of mental situation. And those are external factors that actually cause um, um, disengagement at the workplace. But there are also internal factors factors, internal factors, things that are happening within the organization that as HR people, whilst we take care of these external factors and try to look at them and, you know, what we can do, we need to look at the internal factors as well. And so for some of the, before I even talk about the internal factors, for some of the internal factors that I've talked about, you realize that you need you need, as an HR person, you need um, professional support for your employees. And so some organizations have started understanding the need to support the psychological and mental state of their, of their employees so that they do not get them disengaged or, you know, they become quiet quitters and sometimes, you know, somehow one day you, you, you wake up and you are faced with this great resignation. And so they have introduced retainer uh, psychologists they have had a kind of, you know, uh, some professionals coming into the organization to give talks, you know, run seminars or try to, you know, get these um, uh, specialized, you know, clinics that they have some kind of relationship with that the employees can 
as it were, quietly, you know, go see the professionals, tell them their, their stories, and then see how they help them to bounce back. Most organizations have started introducing counseling um, sessions or getting professional counselors within their employment. Some have actually started training. Some HR persons have actually started training as, a, as counselors, you know, within the space so that they can double up because let's also understand that um, with all these People still, uh, because of where we are, who we are, our kind of culture, um, the kind of stigmatization that we associate with some of these kind of uh, uh, situations, people don't even feel very good, you know, walking into the psychologist office, walking to the a, a mental health um, office because they feel that it's a, it's a sign of a mental illness. But, you know, any kind of illness is illness anyway. So organizations have started introducing this in a much better way that educates the people to understand that if you have um, a depression, if you have a mental situation that really requires a professional to, to, to you, that you require a professional to talk to, there is nothing wrong with it. It is just like any other ailment you can get out of it. And it just starts counseling them in this way, giving them education and that helps them. If you have people who have attention deficiency, then you start asking Asking, how do you provide them with a kind of job that actually uh, excites them and interests them so that they will be they'll get they'll get engaged you know because of what they are doing and you have professionals who can support you to do this so the internal factors uh, well I mean for now let me say that for Kwame's um, for Kwame's question um, I hope he's got an answer to it before I perhaps um, I, I may move into some of the internal factors that actually uh, cause people to be disengaged. Right, Kwame, please, please give us feedback um, if you are um, okay with the response or if um, the response of the Dr. Stella has shared with us is clear for you or you need further clarification let us know please give us feedback so doc whilst you move to talk about the internal factors um gloria is asking why um the term grades resignation and not just resignation um you've already explained that so but i'm sure um maybe she came in quietly so if you can um okay. just uh, give her a briefing on why okay. it's it's great and then we have another question from love love says that um just joined i always enjoy dr ejenim boateng and then she says doc how do you get gen z's motivated and engaged on the job <laughs> so maybe we can take these two questions and then okay. we move to the internal factors all right okay so um i think uh, gloria's question was why not resignation but great resignation yes i mean <laughs> i i know it's very interesting because i mean as hr people we always uh, see resignation so basically it is resignation but the reason why it has been couched this way is just to give a setting um uh, put it in a certain context that these resignations are not the one you know those that trickle in um you know once in a while um you find uh, resignation, you know, in your inbox or on your desk or something. Yes, those happen. But this one we are talking about, resignation that is almost, as it, we describe it, almost like an exodus, where at a certain point in time, you have a lot of people uh, resigning within a certain space of time. And now I'll, I'll, I'll give you, so it's like a great movement. It's, it's like a... Um, you know, if, if you know about this, the great controversy, I mean, it's, it's it's something that is beyond the usual that you see once in a while. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in the in the in the working in the telco um, years back, um, at a certain point, of course, for, for the longest time, um, the, the telco that I was working in, right, um, was was the incumbent. Uh, a state owned, I mean, that was the only telecommunication company in the country. And so, you know, big and large and doing everything, employing over, you know, 6,000 people, um, everything you needed telecom was, was us. Okay. Then along the line, 
the government of the day decided to liberalize the telecom environment. Liberalization meant that competitors, second network operator had been introduced into the market, right? So competition for the first time is staring in your face. Then along the line, you even had the licensing of mobile operators, okay? And so the telecom, the telco industry then became um, flooded, as it were, with, uh, with, with other operators and competition became the strongest and, um, you know, uh, the most interesting, if I should put it that way, at the time. And these telcos that had come in, whether as a second network operator or as a, a mobile telephony providers and all that, they needed to start you know, as to hit the ground running. And so what will happen if you need to hit the ground running? You have found an incumbent, an incumbent that is, you know, uh, large and in charge, an incumbent that has almost every trade and every skill available, an incumbent that had trained the people, but the issue of competition was not in at the time. And now you have come. Obviously, you are going to talk to those people within that 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 in the you know organization. You are going to woo them. You are going to you know kind of uh, poach them. You are you are you are bringing them on board so that you can start with them because these are people who are already skilled. These are people who understand the terrain. They understand the the industry. And so when that happened, we started experiencing great resignation. So now it wasn't one resignation dropping you know, on your table, maybe in, in months or that sort of thing. But now you are going to see attrition happening in terms of resignation where in a day and literally, literally in a day, you can get five, you can get six, you can get 10 in a week, you're massive. And sometimes all your technicians, you know, are kind of trying to resign on block your engineers, your other skilled, you know, people within that space. You cannot look at that and call it, just an ordinary day-to-day -day resignation. That will be great resignation because something is pushing them out. And that is where when we talk about some of the internal factors, you will understand. But the external factor of um, competition, the external factor of um, uh, more opportunities, maybe higher opportunities, um, better roles and all that are actually getting them to, to understand that when we leave and we go here, we are going to get these better opportunities. So that is an example, you know, that I have personally even experienced, you know, in terms of my telco uh, um, work experience and what happened. And we will come to the point where maybe we'll be looking at how you address some of these issues. And that is what, you know, we did to be able to keep uh, the organization running and still be in competition till many other things happened, you know, metamorphosed into, you know, other uh, organizations and all that. So I'm sure that I hope, Gloria, uh, that answers your question, why you call that situation great resignation, which sits differently from the usual uh, resignation, which will just drop, you know, once in a while, typically. So the mass, the exodus, is really what we are talking about as great resignation. I think that the second question, um, uh, yes, the second question was uh, how you get the Gen Zs motivated, engaged on the job, you know? <laughs> so um, uh, every organization typically has different um, categories of different generations coming together to form the, and that is why it's very interesting when you 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 handle diversity, equity, and inclusion, because diversity is not only about gender, which um, really, of course, that is at the forefront because you know we are pushing that agenda very well. But but seriously, uh, diversity also has a lot to do with uh, generational diversity, um, which talks about you know age and all the generation that we're talking about, um, skill diversity. Um, racial or cultural diversity and all kinds of you know uh, diversities but when you talk about the gen z's i mean these are the people that you want to call the digital uh, natives right they are people who you can describe as uh, restless 
when it comes to you just uh, trying to pin them down to routine jobs and you know the job that is repetitive the job that doesn't really challenge their minds they that that is not them i mean the other generations let's say uh the baby boomers the traditionalists the you know other kinds of uh, we have all these categories and maybe one day it will be interesting for us to you know have a session on all these generational you know uh, di di diversities that we have at the workplace some of them are really stable they will do the routine work they like structured you know uh, uh, approach to things they want to think deeply they want to actually do the comparison here and there you take the gen z, the, the gen z and they are very ready to move the next minute they are in a call it they are in a hurry but really that is their generation that's their world because they can get everything you know either from the net i mean digitalization they know the technology their tech survey they know where to find what so they can't wait for the moment and so when you have people like that don't assign them jobs that are routine that are repetitive job that will not challenge their minds they can't do the same thing over and over again just at, just like other generations may you know the 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 the, the exes and the rest may want to do and so if you want to get them engaged always get them you know into projects where they can think beyond the normal get them you know give them some kind of assignments throw things at them let them go think about it research come out with you know and have debates in code debates with them where they you challenge their minds and they are able to get back to you you know in that sort of uh, way so those are the things uh, that and many other things that perhaps we, we can talk about uh, you know, in the course of this session that will help the Gen Z's to actually be engaged. But when you don't do that and you just expect that they will behave like the other generations who can sit, you know, eight to five, uh, do the same thing for the last uh, how many years and then still be happy working with you, then we will be making a mistake because that is not their makeup that is not their makeup and they are global people so they don't just look at your organization much more looking at your local market they are looking everywhere and trying to get information everywhere and comparing you to everything and everybody and everywhere and trying to you know a uh, hop to the next uh, uh um, you know supposedly greener pasta that they can they can have and so you need to really understand them and assign them roles that challenge their minds by the day and they are able to then get engaged because they get excited. I mean, I, I, those were people I used to call them uh, the 18 month people. <laughs> they do one job for maximum 18 months. And oh my goodness, they are like, I mean, everything is just splitting apart. They just want to try something else. Yes, and that's, that's who they are. We can't take that away from them. And so um, is it love who asked the question? Um, I hope that, that that satisfies you. Try to find them and try to work around them to get them engaged in your organization. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Doc. Um, I think now that we are done answering the two, we have some other questions in the comment box, but we would want to um, want you to touch on some of the internal factors um, that affect this engagement. And then we can pick another question from the comments box. Right. Okay. So, so this engagement, you know, um, thank you, patients. We've talked about the external factors, which you need to really uh, keep your, your eyes on. And internally, the reasons why people get in, disengaged is because sometimes the work assigned to them has little or no meaning to them. And, you know, linking that up even to the Gen Z's, as we said, I mean, if the work is not meaningful, there are people who are working and they are disengaged because the things that you have asked them to do or the job that the assignment, the job, the task that they have to do, they cannot even appreciate how that links to the total or the, you know, the strategic vision of the organization. Nobody explains it to them. They are just assigned to do this and they can't do it repeatedly and they don't know how it, it impacts the general you know well-being of the organization and so when people are doing less meaningful jobs or jobs that they find as not really um at the core of the business they can get disengaged because they don't see their contribution to the end game 
So that is one of the internal factors that in trying to get people uh, engaged or, you know, trying to find out why people are disengaged, um, you need to ask yourself, so the job that this individual is doing or this group of people are doing, how do they, how do they in their own mindset, how do they position that job as being a strong contributor to the end game? If that has not been explained, if you can feel that that is not really the way that they are thinking, then it means that you need to find a way of getting that to them and letting it not just be a lip service, but a reality because you should be able to link it to what they are doing. So no meaningful work you know, or where the, the work they are doing is, is less meaningful to them, people get disengaged because their minds are not being taxed, their, their, their skills are not being utilized as much as perhaps it should be used, and so they feel disconnected from the main business or from the strategy of the business or from the work altogether. And people get disengaged when they are also not recognized. Sometimes they are doing a great job they are making great strides, making you know meaningful contributions to the organization. However, they are never recognized, not privately or publicly, nothing. And, and so, you know, you feel that when you start asking yourself, am I really doing what, what I have to do? Nobody has, you know, questioned or sanctioned my work. But somehow, when people are being mentioned in dispatches, I'm never mentioned, I'm never recognized. My line manager has never acknowledged the fact that I did this and did it well. And so you start questioning yourself. And if you have people who even have challenges with their own self-confidence, they start you know, questioning their own self-confidence, their self-worth, and they start feeling that, look, I don't think I belong here, or I don't think my contribution is worth you know, uh, uh, what anybody's expecting. So they start withdrawing for lack of recognition, they start withdrawing and they get to the point where, as we described or defined disengagement, they start switching off. They start switching off gradually, uh, mentally, they switch off, and then emotionally, they switch off because they realize that putting their emotion into what is going on, uh, for the fact that they are not being recognized and they become hurt about it, they become angry at it, you know, they realize that they are draining emotionally. And so they start asking, telling themselves, why should I, you know, drain myself emotionally when nobody even recognizes what I'm doing? I could just, you know, you could just die on the job and nobody cares. And so they start building the emotional strength to withdraw emotionally. And that causes disengagement internally. And then when they cannot see any career or growth opportunities, I mean, there are people who cannot see what the next career move can ever be in that organization. And sometimes it's because your talent management strategy and policies are not well um, uh, 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 displayed, they are not well articulated, or sometimes you don't even have it at all. So people just struggle through and people use all kinds of orthodox and unorthodox, you know, appropriate and inappropriate ways to get to where they want. And when you have people who do not see their, their career path really clear, as saying, you know, I do this and I do that and I have this kind of performance uh, 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 level, assessment level, and I'm doing this extra and I'm bringing in this and I'm contributing in this way. And I can see that, you know, ahead of me are these opportunities and I could, you know, venture into any of these those opportunities. Yes, if they don't see that, then it's like it's just total darkness um, that they, they are envisaging. And when that happens, people get disengaged because it means that no matter how much I put myself into the job, I'm not going to see any, any, any clear uh, um, step out there. And so when the career growth opportunities are not well articulated, they are not explained, they are non-existent, then you can have people getting disengaged. So they check out, they switch off, Physically, you find them there, but they are definitely not with you because they don't see where the next move is coming from. And sometimes, too, you have un, uh, what we call unsupportive work environment. The work environment is not supporting what you are doing in the area of, let's say, resource allocation. 
you really love to do the job and do it well you are happy to go the extra mile you know you want to do all the 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 checks and balances you want to beat competition to it you have new ideas you want to introduce you have you know alternatives that can give you better yields as an organization however the work environment does not support it because even the resources that you need to be able to carry out those activities to bring in it to increase productivity are not available or you know somebody doesn't just want to even give it to you and sometimes you don't even know where to go to and who to go to because between you and your line manager communication is not flowing in the way that should and therefore you don't even know whether you'll be accepted to go and have that kind of conversation with sometimes you are not sure whether the people you are sitting there with are even in support of the idea that you have to bring up to the table sometimes you feel that you go for the meetings and you share your ideas and you are just um you know they are just overlooked and nobody even tries to follow up with you know can you explain it further what really did you you know try to explain how does it you know fit into our strategy just to give you the opportunity to even express to use the resources the knowledge that you have so when the workplace or the work environment creates a certain culture where there is no support coming from anywhere to help build you know your confidence and help support you to deliver beyond what anybody else would then you start thinking that why would i want to you know uh, worry myself to do all that and to think about all this and to put my emotions in the job let me just withdraw my emotion mm -hmm. and when people start withdrawing their emotions then obviously they are withdrawing their mental state and when they withdraw all that they are only left with their physical frame to sit there and to do you know either partake in what uh, is going on or perhaps even you know just switch off as we, we have said and being disengaged so productivity is low uh, absenteeism because i mean whether i come or not nobody even notices it and nobody is going to question me after all they don't even see what i'm doing and so any opportunity to be absent these people and they don't get interested in anything that is happening because after all even when i show the interest what's going to happen nobody is going to give me the resources to carry out what you know i i think will be helpful and uh, nobody is going to recognize me there's no tap on my shoulder to say well done you did it well and uh you know you've made me proud and even amongst the people i mean it is more like a rat race who you know who runs faster and catches the eye of the of the line manager is the one who is going to get it i don't see my way clear when it comes to you know um career and my growth and my progress and so all those you know culminating to people deciding at a certain point in their career to say let me check out but well, I haven't found any new place yet. And so what do I do? I continue to walk along with you, but I'm actually not with you uh, besides you know, my physical being that you are seeing. And sometimes compensation is also a reason why people get disengaged. I mean, they, they, they start looking at compara uh, comparators. They start looking at other organizations that may be in the same industry or, you know, within a certain same, you know, skill set. They start looking at people within same professional uh, um, um, contest and they start asking themselves, I mean, do I, the skills that I bring on board, the resources that, you know, I have to give, my time, my skill, my knowledge, everything else, you know, my whole being that I've put into this work, am I really being, you know, uh, comparable to the market and what the market actually gives for uh, others who perhaps are like me, who are delivering like me, who professionally are astute, blah, blah, blah. And so they start looking at the inadequacy of what, you know, compensation, and they start comparing themselves to the market. And when they feel that they are, they are being shortchanged, when they feel that they are, their skills are not being adequately compensated for, or what they do is not being, you know, adequately compensated for, then you start linking it to maybe that is why I'm not even being recognized. That is why I'm not even seeing my way clear. And so when they start looking at comparators then they start looking at the, their interest in your in the organization start shrinking and when that happens really you have them at a certain point being totally disengaged because they don't think that they need to put in anything better because you know what they are what they are being compensated for is not a, a, a measurable to what really the market is, is doing. So this will be some of the internal factors or causes of disengagement.
And we need to really be looking at these uh, and, and as to how we can address them as HR people to get our people to perhaps move from the state of disengagement to a state of engagement uh, and real uh, authentic connection. Thank you. Right, Doc. Thank you so much. Um, we are enjoying the session with you. Very insightful. And I was going to, um, my next question was going to be how do we address um, these factors that are creating this engagement in the organization, both the external factors and the internal factors. And um, we also have a question from um, Akosia Ejewa, which um, is also in that direction. So I'll read the question out. And then uh, once you are done responding to her, we can now move um, to some of the practical ways to handle disengaged employees at the workplace. So Akosia says that, please, how do you handle a manager who causes a staff disengagement? They don't engage you in anything while there's a lot to do for reasons only known to them. So I guess Akosia wants to find out how do you handle a manager who is the cause of this engagement in yes. or among his team members? Yes. Yes, I could see that. I'm I'm smiling because that it's 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 a very interesting question, and it is it is sometimes the truth of the matter. Um, there are some managers who do not, you know, understand people management, and I would say that at any point in your career, um, it is not a matter of being an HR professional. It's a matter of knowing that you lead people whether you are a technical expert or a whatever it is people who actually make it happen and so we need to start developing uh, the people skills of all leaders at any point in time and let them understand that you know these are things that need to happen for organizations to get the right kind of employees and get employees to be engaged but um let me akosia let me uh, kind of um get your your response to you uh, in trying to respond to how we address this engagement and you will understand the role of the manager and also understand the role of the manager's manager who has to actually ensure that the managers are doing the right thing so i'll start off by saying that in addressing this engagement one of the key things that every organization needs to do is if you are not already doing that people survey Okay, so people, um, uh, or call it employee engagement surveys, need to be done. In some organizations, they will do it once a year. But in organizations where you are seeing certain signs of, you know, what we are talking about, the disengagement, you are seeing this quiet quitting and, you know, uh, resignations or great resignations for that matter, you need to even do the survey. Maybe I recommend like, like twice a year so that you are able to quickly pick issues of disengagement. So for instance, why would you, you know, if you do if you do that regularly, then you track the 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 responses that you get. You track issues of absenteeism, track issues of productivity, track issues of morale. And when you do these things, you'll be able to situate the situation in its rightful place and understand that look, in that particular year, we are we are all in a particular quarter or half year or whatever. We are experiencing too, you know, uh, many cases of absenteeism. What is driving that? Perhaps it could be real absenteeism where maybe health uh, um, practitioners have actually given excuse duty to your staff, and you start asking why are these individuals always getting you know this excuse duty. Is it because truly there are some external factors that are affecting them emotionally, psychologically, uh, depression is setting in? Is there some stress induced, you know, uh, health challenges that our people are going through? And will that be internal stress or external stress or what? And so you start categorizing that and be able to know the answers, whether you need psychologists, you need counselors, you know, to tackle this for you or internally. Certain things are happening that need to be tackled internally. And that is where in your people survey, there should be a portion that you actually um, um, look at line manager index. 
line manager scores. So the question should be said that the survey should produce a result that actually tells you how each line manager has been um, um, appraised, as it were. And the conduct of the survey will tell you what people think about their line managers. And so you'll be able to understand managers who are stifling the progress, the effort of their people. And you can see from the results of that survey that such managers, the employee engagement score for their departments or their units are going to be low. And so you start asking, why is it that the employees in this particular unit or this particular department are scoring low on engagement? And the line manager of that line manager needs to then have a conversation with this line manager to kind of explain what is going on within that space of his or her people. And perhaps that HR needs to then get involved to actually analyze some of these things and be able to find the reasons and then have one-on-one -on -one conversations with line managers whose teams are recording low engagement. And then when you have those one-on-one -on -one with those managers, you should be able to assess their own connection to their to their, their people. And like Akosia said, you will find out that some of them are totally disconnected from their people. And that is the only reason people may be leaving. That's the only reason people are disengaged. You know, it is said that people don't leave organizations. They leave their managers. So you will realize that there are people in a particular department that are always even seeking for transfers to other units or other regions or other departments. You start asking yourself why. It is not always because they have found better opportunities in other, other units within the same organization. Sometimes they are typically running away from certain managers. And HR needs to find this through the, the assessment or through the service to tease out what is happening within particular you know, uh, um, uh, unit and start having conversations, sometimes very difficult, hard conversations with these managers and also have conversations sometimes one-on-one -on -one, sometimes group conversation with the team members of the team and when they have gotten to the point of being disengaged they'll be ready to speak to you about reasons why they are disengaged and you'll be able to you know kind of trace it either to the manager or to the bigger organization or sometimes even to hr itself to some of our policies they are disengaged because of some of our policies they are disengaged because of you know lack of communication is a reason why people get disengaged because they don't know what is happening they don't understand anything nothing is communicated to them nothing from them is communicated up nothing up is communicated to them at the bottom and when that happens you start asking yourself who is being the bottleneck is the bottleneck the manager who is not trying to help open up and disseminate information to the team so they understand what is going on. And so you need to use the people survey concept as a way of actually handling um, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, disengaged uh, uh, situations. Again, to be able to address it, you need to encourage a supportive work culture. And when you talk about supportive work culture, what are we talking about? You are talking about a work culture where everybody feels that he or she is 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 needed. Your skill is needed. Your 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 contribution is needed. And so there is open communication, information flow. There's open uh, you know uh, openness around the readiness of managers, team members, and other people to actually support each other through you know. Uh, uh, technology transfer so that they can do their work more efficiently or even through knowledge transfer so that people feel, let's say there is a project and you even have consultants on the project. Some people locally, as it, uh, you know, your employees need to be there with them as counterparts who may be learning from these experts, who may be learning from these consultants so that the knowledge transfer gives them that extra uh, um, uh, uh, knowledge and skill to be able to do it. And with that kind of situation, they find that the, the organization has a work culture that is supportive, a work culture that is supporting to build their skills so that the next time around, they will even be put in charge of some of these projects to do. And when people feel like that, there is nothing that really disengages them because they, they see the way forward. They see, you know, the, the, the resources that are being spent on them to be able to deliver on the job and to have support support from everybody else. So teamwork needs to be encouraged. If you want to address disengagement, you need to 
really encourage teamwork. There are some managers who hardly ever meet their teams or get into team meetings. They, I mean, typically, it's as if they are trying to avoid their team members, and that causes disengagement. So if you want to address it, you need to ensure that there's structured team meetings, whether it is weekly or bi-weekly, there must be structure around your team meetings where people come into the meeting knowing that, you know, they are going to discuss the job, they are going to discuss the activities, and they are going to discuss their challenges, and the manager will be ready to pick up their challenges and support them by providing leadership and providing some kind of networking support to help them. And then it helps the team to, to you know, uh, to, to really bond. And when a team is bonded, each one becomes the other person's keeper and so you can freely walk to your work colleague and start asking questions so they can support you after all i mean you don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time but when team meetings and teamwork is absent then the manager is faulted because it's the manager's responsibility to have these team meetings again the manager needs to build or address this issue of disengagement through feedback constant structured feedback sessions with your employees because people need to, to to speak people need to share their thoughts people need to share their emotional stress and you know work life challenges and all that and when they are able to do that they and or you give them feedback on their activities then they're able to tell you what challenges they have they are happy when the it is positive and they are even happy when the feedback is negative because they know it's constructive you are helping them to grow everybody has a growth gap and you're helping them to grow and sometimes the feedback is yes you said it and we did it so when you said this we took it on board and then we have worked on it and this is what the outcome is every employee is so excited and you get their buy-in because the moment they feel that what they said has contributed to the final result of something the organization has done. Everybody get, feels that, yes, I was part of this decision. And that buy-in itself addresses the issue of disengagement because then you feel that you are part, you are connected to the center. And you need to also attract top talent and be ready to pay for your talent. I mean, you cannot attract top talent and then, you know, not ready to pay for the for the scale for the talent obviously if they you have already you know uh, uh, kind of uh, got them in and they cannot find a way out immediately for a period they'll be disengaged until they find you know reasons to fly out and so you need to ensure that you build a total reward package policy that actually addresses some of these things because whether we like it or not financial sometimes cause people to be dis disengaged there should be opportunities for professional development and growth people should know their way forward people development you know learning and development can be expensive but obviously you can't get anything cheap. So as managers, as HR persons, we need to build very resilient, strong uh, developmental um, opportunities for our people. And that is where we need to get uh, uh, you know, the skills gap, do our skills or they know the skills gaps of individuals and try to use their performance to actually create the right training for them. Because if training is only used as a favor you know, to people or as a thank you, then obviously you are not filling their gaps or you are not trying to work, the training is not working on their gaps. But when you really invest in training, it must be the right investment and people should see the opportunity that those investments are bringing so that they can also deliver to us to a pay for that investment that year. So when the opportunities are not there, they cannot. And then you need to recognize and uh, uh, appreciate their contribution. Let people know that what they are doing is right. And therefore, you know, you are pushing them and urging them on. And anybody, any normal human being get excited when they are pushed on, when they acknowledge, when they are, they are applauded. And of course, promote inclusiveness. When people, when you don't use inclusiveness and you are creating divide and rule, as a manager, obviously, you will get an in group, an out group, and I can assure you that your out group may still be sitting here, but they feel outside of your, your, you know, that embrace. And so those people will obviously be disengaged. So these are ways that you can address both the external and internal uh, uh, disengagement, you know, um, the causes of disengagement and people who may be in your team who are disengaged. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Irene Stella. Agenium Boatin insightful conversation on dealing with disengagement, um, great resignation, and quiet quitting. Um, 
so um all too soon our time is up um i know doc has a lot to share with us probably we'll schedule another session for um this particular conversation but we have um love is back again so we'll take one last question and that will be from love and after that um doc will give us her final words and then we would um call it um um an evening for this episode so let me go back to love love says i agree with the employee survey but what happens when the employee refuses or the employee refuses to speak up they won't even want to respond to survey no matter how no matter how you encourage them to do so because of bad management leadership in the past okay so love yeah um you are right but it depends on how it is done so let me share with you my experience and what i've done in the past and what has really worked so in an organization that i worked uh, with um employee survey is obligatory it is mandatory for every single individual in the organization and it is done such that a third party actually um runs it and runs it remotely so you only get a link you it's anonymous and you respond to questions the questions are not direct so it's not they, they there's no way you find who answered what and how even your answer is going to be um you know is going to churn out to to actually be analyzed and so that too was so helpful that and you know what everybody has to do so in the team you can see that this team you have 36 people in the team at a certain point because there's a timeline so let's assume that it's being done in a month okay that in this month from this day to that day it's a people survey um a period everybody so it's flexible everybody has the time you know just spend your 20 minutes or 30 minutes max uh you know to answer the questions in different categories and in different chunks and when it is done it's it then takes that let's let me use hr as an example so let's say you have that six people in hr so when anybody does it the response comes to the hr person or the hr manager to say that six people in hr have completed their people survey we don't know who those six people are somebody else does it you know 10 12 until you get to that so as a line manager because it is mandatory and it is part of your assessment that any time the people survey window is opened all your employees or your your team members must do it you kind of make sure that there is a, a reminder every time from hr and from the line manager that look we are 80 percent complete and um, it looks like 20 percent of us have still not answered we have four days to the end of the uh, the period we must answer because that actually also goes against the line manager if all your employees do not to the extent that because it is a link even people who are on leave who are on maternity uh, or whatever the link is sent to them and they can do it from anywhere and then because it's a third party that is actually you doing it they come with the you know the, the scores and then hr now you sit and use the scores to do the analysis to find out the, the organization wide what is your employee engagement score as an organization what are the breakdown the employee engagement scores for each department and if the department let's say hr department your employee engagement score is 40 percent obviously who should answer for that the the head of that department you it tells you that your people are not engaged and so what are the things that are causing the disengagement through your one-on-ones and through you know what you know you can tease out you start working towards an input and every time so over the years you do a trend analysis and you can see whether your engagement is going up department per department organization per organization or it is dropping or you know you are just um uh, slipping back and forth and those and some actually some line managers can sometimes lose the certain positions you know because there are people they are constantly being uh, um, scored low on a people engagement and on their line manager index their own activities as line managers so that is one of the areas of doing it making sure that it is not done in-house but it is done by a third party so um 
short of saying is something like mystery shopping short of saying that and you can get real results because people when people know that they are not going to be identified as it were you know they are able to speak up and then we also had another way of you know managing some of these things and we call the speak up so speak up it was like a toll free number that we had in the organization and this toll free number you can call it and again it's a third party that is managing it from elsewhere and when you call that number you have a right to either mention your name if you want to or you say that i want to remain remain anonymous and then whatever issue whether it is good or bad or ugly you 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 speak out and then the information is taken and it is outlined and the hr director is sent that information that you know from your organization a certain you know report has been received that perhaps this manager is not treating his or her people well and that is causing a lot of disaffection perhaps it's causing a lot of you know stress etc we've got this information as hr director for the organization you have two weeks to investigate and then report back and when you have this data what do you do you start talking to people you start finding out you start observing you start making certain you know inroads into where the challenge is coming from and thankfully if you're an hr person you need to be um, you are put in a certain position of serious trust um and you need to be trusted you need to be seen to be very confidential you need to be able to be put in a position of where you communicate what is needed people need to trust your judgment people need to trust your confidentiality so when you have all those attributes i can assure you that people come to you directly or indirectly and you're able to get information and the way you maturely handle that information to get the right results and feedback to the main organization and to people what the results are and to find remedies that they can clearly see and feel that you are finding remedies to solve this problem without letting them out you will get the right results but unfortunately there are some hr practitioners who cannot zip up who you know will say anything and everything anywhere mention names and go behind people and when you are found like that you will have a serious challenge because disengagement will abound you know quitters will be there and you will find these great resignations and so i think that as hr practitioners we need to build our own gravitas and build our own status i mean in terms of how people believe in us our trustworthiness and all that and our stronghold on organizational policies and how we handle people and that in itself will be a mark in the right direction where people will start believing in us and then we're getting a lot of engaged people other than you know disengaged people so love i think there are ways of doing it and they are feasible they are done and i i can tell you that they really yield the best results right thank you doc Thank you so much. Um, if I love, before you ended, had already given us her feedback. She says, apt response. I admire you so much, um, Doc. We have a lot of um, comments um, coming in, but unfortunately, because of our time, um, we... Doc is very is a very busy person, so um, going beyond um, our one hour session with her, um, it's a big privilege. Okay, so let me read some few comments. Um, right, so um, Joyce says I couldn't agree less with Doc. Training and development can be expensive, but should be promoted to reduce disengagement in organizations. Daku says, wonderful, really an eye opener. Thank you, Doc. Um, Ejewa says, thank you so much, very insightful. Um, Patrina, or Patrina Ousu, okay, I guess I pronounced your word, your, your name right. Um, says, very insightful presentation. Thank you, Doc. Um, 
Samuel says, another insightful session. Thanks, Doc. Stephanie says, very good insight, Doc. I agree with you that organizations should hold managers accountable for their actions and behaviors, including their interactions with their teams. All right, I've already read that of love and... Um, um, Joyce says, great response from Doc. Thank you, Georgie. Ofori said, I couldn't have missed this insightful session for anything. I would be surprised if you really missed it. <laughs> and I say, thank you so much, Doc, for the practical examples you have shared with us. Um, Love says, we need her to come again. Doc, this one is <laughs> not from me. Thank you, love. So that uh, don't we'll say that I want her to. I'm happy it came to you. Right. Uh, we have Jerry here. Jerry says, "Whoa, wonderful! It's been so great listening to you. Of course, it's always a great session with Doctor Irene Stella Ejenimbuate. Thank you so much, Doc, for um coming. I guess we'll take your final word and then um, we'll end our episode for today. Right." Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks to all of you for those um, encouraging words. Um, uh, I'm delighted that we can, we can always learn together and support um, our profession. So uh, my last words, I mean, all that I will say is that, you know, as HR people and as leaders, as managers, it's important for us to promote diversity, promote equity and inclusion. If we want to get our people to be engaged, let's handle our employees as unique stakeholders, you know, categorized based on their contribution to the business needs, their interest, the strategy, and their support for the strategy, and handle them as such. So, for example, let's give jobs, you know, um, that, that they, they can understand and appreciate. Let us support them in doing these jobs. And let us also know that we need to put in place structured um, retention policies, structured ways of finding out what is really eating our people up and what is making them excited so that we'll be able to uniquely handle them. Don't let us think that everybody will be the same. We have our unique purpose, but let us not also forget about the fact that external and internal factors ex exist to make the individual whole to contribute to their business. And when we lose sight of these factors, we actually create a monster in our people and they get disengaged, we get frustrated, nothing goes on, the organization suffers. And at the end of the day, when there is no organization, we will also not have any place to, you know, uh, to, to exercise our trade and our profession. Let us get into the business of HR, understanding that the H stands for the human. And so that part of it, which helps us to build people and understand you know, what they go through to eventually build our organizations really will be you know, something that we can all be proud of. So on that note, I think that we've talked a lot about the disengagement, um, uh, quite quitting, um, you know, great uh, resignation. Just check within your organizations. I'm sure that when you put some things in, you know, in perspective, you will find these. And the things that we've talked about, you can use some of those those methodologies and tools to address those issues. And I'm sure your organizations will be very proud of you. And I will be proud of you. And I think the HR fraternity will be proud of you. Thank you absolutely, so much. Absolutely, absolutely. Doc will be very proud of you. Said that HR Digest will be proud of you as well, and the HR fraternity will be proud of you. This is Said that HR Digest, and today we discussed how to handle this engagement, um, great resignation, and quiet quitting. And our resource person was Dr. Irene uh, Stella Ejenimbuati, the current vice chair person of um, Public Services Commission. She is um, um, an HR practitioner. In fact, um, she I, I'm sure someone will say, but she's no more than a, please. Once an HR, always an HR. So um, Doc, Doc is still an HR practitioner. And here at Sedat HR Digest, we are very proud to have um, 
that association with her. Anytime we call on her, she responds um, um, to us. And we want to say a very big thank you to um, Dr. Stella for joining us um, on today's episode. And thank you to all of you for joining us. It's, it's, it's a very great pleasure having you here and contributing to our discussion week in, week out. We bring you insightful um, and topical HR um trending topics for us to learn and also to impact our organizations. There's a set at HR Digest. We will share the link of this um, conversation with you. Please um, share it with your loved ones, your colleagues, your leaders, your managers. Let us all listen. Let us all learn to build a solid, engaged employee or solid engaged team members who would help us to impact positively on our organization. All right. So remember, um, the week starts tomorrow. Put your objectives in place. Have a plan for the week and make sure that you work very hard to achieve your objectives for the week which you set for yourself thank you so much once again that's a set at hr digest and my name is patience crunchy and i was your host for today next week we'll be coming your way with another insightful um topic you don't want to miss that again please don't miss if you really missed you came late don't miss and don't come late next week have a good evening and enjoy your week bye